Hey, that was a cool video. <laughs> it was. This is a brand new uh, sort of set of bumpers uh, that it's been a while since I've seen them. So, um, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, same for me. Same for me. And hey, let's do a more formal intro because I was like a little kid enjoying the video, the music and more. So, hey, hello, everyone. My name is Bruno, Bruno Capuano. I live in Canada, in the mountain side near Toronto. I'm super happy to be with Luis today talking about AI. And hey, I start to see comments of, from people all around that we have people from Brazil, from Germany and more. Let us know where, where are you joining. And hey, I'm a cloud advocate in the .NET team. I really, really like AI. And I'm super happy to be with Luis today because we are going to start to do this bi-weekly session about AI and .NET. And hey, this is the best place to start uh, with Luis. Luis, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Luis Quintanilla. I am uh, a product manager uh, at Microsoft working on AI uh, and specifically AI and .NET, right? So anything that's, you know, .NET and AI related, helping .NET developers add AI to their apps, right? That's sort of my happy place. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, you know, old friends uh, joining in the chat here. So uh, if you are not, you know, sort of familiar with this stand-up, right, it actually, you know, it, w it did take place, um, you know, many, many moons ago. And so we're kicking it back up and, you know, Bruno's here hosting and, and you know, just uh, spreading the AI message, right? And so um, just really excited to be here, really excited to see, you know, again, old friends and also, uh, you know, get to meet new friends as well. Yes, yes. And uh, hey, this is great. And I, I try to put everyone on the screen at least, but the comments are starting to get stuck here. So sorry if I miss someone. It's lovely to see people from all around the, the globe. And the whole idea for, for today is, I mean, AI is hot. We are not going to talk about how amazing is AI, but sometimes there are so many things in the AI space that is super, super, it's, it's not easy to, to find a nice place to start. So I know that you have something amazing there, Luis. So if you want, I am going to check, uh, check the comments, try to help with the comments. But if you want to give us the hello world of AI starting there, that will be amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tall ask, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do our best here. Uh, and yeah, let's just uh, kick it off. And, you know, if you have any questions as we're going through it, um, right, like just feel free to, you know, chime in in the chat. Uh, and yeah, just let us know. We'll, we'll try to answer your questions as best as possible here. Um, and I thought maybe we can just kind of start with just a quick intro. I'm pretty sure by now everybody's heard about AI and, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, you might hear some terms like just being interchangeably used and stuff like that. And so, like, I thought maybe we just kind of level set, right, have a primer as to what exactly are we even talking about here. Um, and then kind of dive into, you know, the .NET ecosystem and some of the things that you can use from, from .NET, you know, in the .NET ecosystem to add AI to your applications. And so um, this is a, you know, super high level diagram here of like AI, right? And artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence? Um, and so at a high level, everything is AI, right? Like the high, you know, overarching umbrella um, is, is AI, right? And so one of the things with this slide, which is a little bit dated now, um, but that I wanna kind of clarify here. So essentially AI is just like agents doing tasks that would be typically performed by humans, right? And so typically this has not meant the agents that you might hear of nowadays, right? Where you hear, you know, the co-pilots and that stuff like that. They're similar, but they're not exactly here. Agents here, we're just referring to this thing that is doing something on your behalf, right? And so that could be as simple as, you know, the rules filter in your inbox, right? That's something that you would usually go and, and, and basically like, you know, set up like, okay, well, you know, what this email, if it's coming from my boss, right, I'm going to shove it into this folder, right, in my inbox and clean it up that way. And so, so from that perspective, right, it's it's something that's smart, right? You would have to do that manually, but now you're sort of offloaded it to this, you know, to, to your mail client, right, to do that for you. And it's not, that's not particularly smart, right? You're setting sort of these like, if, you know, if and set a rule, right? If it's this from this email address, do something with it, right? Um, that works pretty well until you kind of start to like, have a bunch of if statements, right? So for example, if it's like, oh, well, if it arrived at this time and, you know, there were people in the CC tag, like there's, there gets to a point where you're just like, there's so many if statements and the rules are so complicated that I can't account for every single edge case, right? So instead of me just writing and setting the rules, right? And building these rule-based systems, 
maybe I just want to use machine learning, right, to help me with that. And so the way that machine learning and AI is sort of a little bit different is with machine learning, you're basically like taking data, right? So historical data. So you'd be like, hey, all the emails that were sent to me, right, or all the pictures of cats, whatever that may be. And then you're sort of applying some algorithms on top of that, right? And then you're like learning from the data, the patterns. And so now instead of you setting the rules, right, you're letting these algorithms learn the patterns on their own and then apply them going forward as to, you know, when you get new data. Um, then you sort of get into the deep learning space, which is just specific set of algorithms known as neural networks. And then generative AI, which is, you know, all the rage nowadays, basically just like way down there in terms of like, it's using specific set of deep learning algorithms, right, to generate content, images, text, videos, right? And so, and so, yeah, so that's kind of just at a high level, like what these different terms mean. And like, you know, when we're referring to generative AI, right, this is specifically what we're talking to, or what we're talking about. Um, let's see, okay, so what can you do? I'm sure you've all tried Copilot. I'm sure you've already tried all the various tools that are out there that are powered by AI. Right. And so there's a lot of things that you can do. Right. And so here you can see from this diagram, I'm not going to kind of go through all of these. Right. But again, it's that predictive thing where you give there's a model, you run some data through it and then it does something, whether that's generating text, whether that's, you know, predicting, um, you know, sort of anomalies. Right. So predictive maintenance, all those sorts of things. Right. That's kind of what AI and um, and, and sort of uh, ML can can help you do. Right. And can make you be more efficient that way. And so at a high level, you can kind of like just think like, okay, well, what do I need, right? Well, there's two things. You need data and you need a model for, for running these things. And, and how you get to a model is going to differ depending on your scenario, right? So it's the usual question. It's like, oh, what should I use for X, Y, C? And usually the answer is going to be, it depends, right? And so when, when you're thinking about like getting a model, Right. It's it's very common to, you know, if you were thinking of like the build versus buy type, not not quite, but, you know, somewhat related. Right? And so the thing there's many axes that you can kind of cut this across, but let's just keep it a, a sort of you know relatively simple here in terms of like on the uh, sort of X axis here on the bottom here, you see like how unique is my scenario. Right. If, for example, all I'm really doing is I'm, you know, just generically like uh, trying to capture the sentiment of some uh, some product reviews, right? That's a fairly generic thing, right? And and it's a fair widely applicable sort of scenario, right? Like the details of what products you're you're reviewing, right, might differ, but in general, it's like it's it, it's effectively like the same problem that you're trying to solve, right? And so if if your scenario is not that unique, right, and it's sort of widely applicable, right, you might find yourself in this sort of like lower left hand side of the quadrant, uh this this graph, right, where you might just be able to take off the shelf models that are already out there and just start using them, right? And so that will work in many cases for your scenario. And the cost to that or the complexity, right, is not, it, usually it's not that high, right? And what I mean by that is you don't need to go through the process of training a machine learning model to sort of do the task that you intend to do, right, and solve your problem. You're just taking something that's already built and then bringing it into your application, you know, using it in your application. And this could be things like services that are already out there, right? So if you, you know, for example, with AI services in Azure Open AI Service, which we'll talk about in a little bit, right? You don't need to know, like, you know, what, how is this model built? What, how am I going to train this model? Like all those things, you just don't really have to worry about because you can just make an, you know, usually an HTTP request. And so the model just, the, you know, the service just handles all the complexities, right? You just need to keep, give it, give it your data, right? And then it does what it needs to do, and then it gives you back a response, which you then sort of display to your users, right? And a lot of folks are going to actually find themselves in this off-the-shelf sort of scenario where it's like, my 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 use case is, is not that unique, right? Um, but then you know, I sort of mentioned, well, you know, maybe there's, you know, let's imagine that you're going through like some some documents that are specific to uh to your enterprise or to your business right um and and actually there's there's one that's like actually right in the middle here um which is we're also going to be talking about here which is uh you know retrieval augmented generation right that sits right between off the shelf and sort of fine tuning um and so that's basically just you know using additional context to sort of help the model come up and you're still using off the shelf models but you're not fully training or retraining this data 
if your scenario starts to get a little bit more unique, right, um, and you're sort of hitting the limits of those off-the-shelf models, as I mentioned, sort of RAG, which we'll talk about later, you know, you can le definitely leverage that. Or you can go that extra step of then just, you know, taking an off-the-shelf model and training it specifically on your data. Now, once we're getting into this sort of territory of fine-tuning, right, then the cost and complexity sort of starts to go up, right? Because now you do have to think about getting data and preparing it to, to train this model. Now you are thinking about, you know, different components that are involved with this. And although you're not building a model from scratch, there's still additional steps rather than just, you know, taking something that's off the shelf, right? And then the very far sort of end of this is like, okay, well, I'm going to go build a brand new custom model. So for example, if you've seen some of the latest, um, you know, releases from say like OpenAI, for example, right with the Sora model where you can you know give it some text and generate some videos right that's you know tip of the spear latest research right the stuff that like there's nothing out there whether through fine tuning or off the shelf that can solve this problem so i'm going to go and build my own custom model right and so that's there and it's definitely an option but you're going to see that obviously like your scenario needs to be so unique that there's nothing out there that can solve your problem and at the same time, right, from a cost and complexity perspective, there's a lot involved there, right? Because now you're managing, you know, sort of the full end to end. Um, so, yeah, so regardless of where you sort of sit on that spectrum, right, um, .NET has a lot of different sort of, uh, you know, if, if you're a .NET developer, there's a lot of different ways that you can sort of, you know, leverage, you know, or, or, or use models, um, again, depending on where you're falling on the spectrum. So. Um, in terms of services, right, you have Azure OpenAI, right, which you get access to the GPT set of models, Dolly, Whisper, right, all those things. And so those are more, you know, tend to be geared more towards the OpenAI set of models that are, uh, you know, and, and specifically generative AI set of models. Yeah. Um, but you also have the Azure AI services, right? And so Azure AI services, formerly known as cognitive services, right? Um, they allow you to do task specific things like, for example, object detection or image classification, uh, document intelligence, right? There's a lot of different tasks that you can do that are sort of one offs um, that AI services sort of help you do, right? And this is not exclusive, right? Because there are places where you might be using multiple of these services in conjunction to build your application, right? Now, in order to sort of compose or build your applications, you're going to need access to libraries and, and frameworks to help you do that, right? And so there's a variety of them, right? And, and in the .NET ecosystem, the AI and ML story, it's it's long running, right? Like Although Gen AI and Open AI and those things are sort of, you know, the, the, the latest and greatest, um, .NET has been doing AI and ML for quite some time now, right? And so Semantic Kernel is one of the new entrants in terms of, you know, allowing you to orchestrate these different components like, say, vector databases or, you know, or whatever other type of database and, you know, your model and helping you, you know, build these Gen AI style of applications. Semantic Kernel is a really good option for you to do that. More on sort of like the fine tuning and building your own model, specifically the classical ML model. So this is like pre, you know, pre deep learning, um, right? And, and even some deep learning models, right? You have ML.net. Right. And so ML.NET sort of helps you do that. You can take models that are off the shelf. You can train your own models, right? And, and, and you can sort of do it that way. There's different other sort of components and layers to this, like AutoML, there's TorchSharp, the SciSharp community, um, Onyx. There's a lot of different components here that you can leverage, right, in order to help you um, sort of add AI or add models uh, to, to your .NET applications. And then there's obviously tools that are here as well, like Polyglot Notebooks you know, the, the ML.NET set of tools like Model Builder and Nancy Lai. So regardless where you land on that spectrum of I'm um, taking something off the shelf or I am going and build something custom, right? There is something for you here. So enough talking. Um, let's see some code. Um, while I'm switching, are there any questions or anything that we wanted to bring up? No, I mean, a lot of amazing people saying hello for all over the world. That's great. Team. And hey. Theodore, I'm sorry if I say your name, but sorry about that. I'm the worst with name pronunciation. Saying sorry is at the beginning. He's asking about interesting to see Python-like libraries in terms of capabilities in C sharp. So I ask him back about hey, any specific one, and he said that an example SciPy. And I know that we have libraries. We I was literally using Olama Sharp yesterday, which is a port from the Olama library there. So I know that we have, I know that you know, we may want to, I know that we have an agenda today, but we may want to 
cover maybe an episode about that, saying this is the top popular Python and this is what we have in .NET that are basically the same or whatever. I don't know. Any thought that you have there? Because I see a lot of libraries ported or a lot of similar libraries in the .NET world. Yeah, there there are there are a few, right? Um, and so ML.NET, so if you were to so go to sort of um, you know look at it side by side, you know, in many ways, and it's 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 a little bit more than that, but you can think of, for example, ML.NET in its very early days, you could have thought of it like scikit-learn, right? Yes. Where scikit-learn, you can train classical machine learning model regression, you know, logistic regression, you have you you name it, right? Um, and you could sort of do that in .NET. In terms of AutoML, same story there, right? There's those components. Um, there's some new libraries which I'm going to kind of show here. Um, but for if you're doing some sort of like you know vector type operations on your data, right? Um, you can sort of sort of uh, leverage these libraries like tensor primitives to be able to do that. Um, we're also working, you know, currently on on tokenizers, right, and and stuff like that. So there's a lot there, and I think to your point, Bruno, right? There's a lot of there's an opportunity here to sort of say, okay, well, what's in sort of you know this ecosystem, and then you know what, how could you do that in .NET? Let's see. I see there's another question um, coming in here for, uh, what is it? Is it Kavita? Which one? How about yeah, the local you know, LLM? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so there's actually a few. Um, I think Bisultan and, and Kavita here, right? Uh, talking about like local models yes. and stuff like that. So there's a few ways um, of doing this, right? Uh, one is through by leveraging Torch Sharp, right? Or you can also leverage Onyx as well. There's a few ports, right? For example, I think it's Llama. I think I saw it a while ago. Llama 2, right? Had Onyx versions of it. So if you if, if there is an Onyx version of the model, you know, you can certainly bring it and and use it for inferencing that way, right? Um, and so if, if that's the way that you, you, you choose to go, right? That's certainly a possibility. Um, let's see. Cool. All right, so let's maybe move on for now, or do we have any more questions you want to? No, no, do you want to? Let me share the link to the to the videos and the repo, because the cool thing mm -hmm. about this is that, hey, you can try this. There is a repo where everything that Luis is showing right now is a public repo that you can go there, clone it, fork it, up to you, do whatever you want, but you can test this, you can do more, and hey, I don't think that we are going to cover everything that we have today, but Luis has an amazing series. I am going to share the link right now of videos, intros to all of the topics that we want to show today. So if we don't finish today, hey, you, you can watch everything. You can try everything later. And the final one is that send for the ideas that you have here, like libraries or running local LLMs, because we want to start to do these shows. So we want to have topics. And hey, if you have those requests, this is what you want to serve. Someone wants to see local large language models. Let's do an overview there. There is a lot of amazing people who know that space. So that's that's kind of the idea. So yeah, and I'd cool. actually, yeah, I actually even take it uh, a step further here, which is to say, if you're doing something cool with these libraries and frameworks and you know uh, models and AI, we love to hear from you, right? And, and feature you on the show and and you know have you sort of show off the things that you're working on. So that's also a possibility here as well. Uh, okay, let me sort of dig in here. Let me switch back. So I am here in Code Spaces. So that's the other thing. The repo has Code Spaces enabled. If you haven't tried Code Spaces uh, or Dev Containers for that matter, I highly recommend it. Um, I haven't set any of this up. Um, I haven't set up any of this up here uh, on my local machine. This is just running in the browser, right? And it's all configured for me. And you're going to see here, if you go over to that repo beginner series, there's actually a ton of really good stuff on sort of, um, you know, all .NET, right? So this is just, you know, getting started with .NET. There's MAUI, uh, as well as a few other things, Blazor, containers, all the things, right? So if you just want to get started with .NET in general, that beginner series repo is the place for you to, to check it out. Um, but within that repo, we have the AI and ML one, right? So that's kind of what we're looking at here. And so I have my code space set up. Everything's sort of, you know, running well. And you're going to see here the thing that I have open is uh, a polyglot notebook. So if you're not familiar with notebooks or polyglot notebooks, these are effectively just a, um, they're this interactive programming environment, right? So when you do things uh, and you execute, 
these things that are known as cells. When you run one of these, um, it just, you know, it, it the, the code is evaluated and the output is displayed for you, right? So um, in this case, we're going to start with a very basic intro, right? So if you recall back to the sort of, you know, complexity versus uniqueness type of um, graph, right? We're here taking just an off the shelf model. In this case, it's the open AI set of models, right? And then we're just going to be using this package, the open a Azure AI open AI package, Nougat package, right? And this contains a, an SDK that allows you to talk to the open AI set of services, whether that's open AI or Azure open AI, right? So you can turn, you can use this package for, for either one. In this case, I'm going to be using the Azure one. Um, but again, right, it doesn't matter which one you're using. So, sorry, Luis, can yeah. you zoom a little? There is a people yes. saying that it's maybe oh. a little blur. So, oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, 125. I right think now. it's better there. Thanks. Okay. Sweet. Um, okay, so um, let's see. So here we have this uh, package. This is how you reference packages. So you can, you know, if you were to do this in a console app, uh, sorry, if you were to do this with the .NET CLI, right, it would be something like .NET add package, and then you give it the package, right? So in notebooks, this is how you add a reference to the packages. And so here we're just installing the package. You can see that it's running. It's it's being evaluated right now. And then this little check mark just telling me like, okay, it's ready to go. Right? Um, then we just nothing uh, really exciting happening here. Just bring our packages in, uh, grabbing a few environment variables. Right, these are the keys that we're going to need for our services. And then we go through the process of creating a client, specifically an open AI client. Right, and so let me just kind of uh, run this because I haven't run it before. Okay. And so now we get to the part where we're defining a system prompt. And so the system prompt is effectively what kind of sets the guidance for how, uh, you know, your, the model is supposed to respond to your requests, right? Um, and so this is really where you set all of the guide rails um, for, for, for how, how you want the, this model to interact and, and respond to users. And so in this case, it's like, hey, I enjoy hiking, so I want to have recommendations, right? Um, you know, I want to discover what else is out there. And so in this case, we're telling it that the sort of this sort of persona that the, the that the model sort of embodies, right, or the domain of knowledge that the model embodies is sort of uh, a hiking into uh, a, a hiking assistant, right? And so it's basically just like you're a hiking enthusiast. You help people discover fun hikes. Um, you're friendly. You introduce yourself uh, when people help uh, when you're helping people out, right? Um, you want to basically ask two questions, right, to help provide better guidance for them. And one is like, where are they located and what type of intensity uh, are they looking for in terms of the hike? And then it just provides three suggestions and so on and so forth, right? So this is kind of what we're expecting, uh, how we're expecting the model to respond to us. Then we go ahead and com configure a whole bunch of stuff in terms of the chat completion options here. Um, the deployment name, that's just like which model we're going to be using. Um, tokens, right? So tokens are... Uh, basically, if you think about it, the way that these models work is they work by predicting the next token, right? And you can think of a token like a word, right? Um, and so um, in this case, we're telling you, hey, like just a lot, like 400 uh, tokens worth, you know, for the responses and the conversation that's about to take place, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Hey, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no, go for it. We're not going to talk about a lot of these topics today. But if I can advise uh, someone to go and read a little more and study a little more, go for tokens. Because that's when we use these models, that's the unit of measure. This is what we are going to pay when we use the model. So I can't remember the numbers right now, but when we use GPT-4, GPT-3.5 Turbo, in example, we pay for a 1,000 tokens. So it's super interesting to know how you can, in example, define the max token that you are going to use or not. So tokens is a super interesting topic. And it's not, yes, as Suri said, it's not a word equals a token, but there is something like this. A thousand words is 700 tokens or something, depending on the words and more. So if you want to know more about tokens, go for there because it's super, super important because that's what we pay at the end. Oh, yes, you have the tokenizer there. <laughs> Let's see, is this is gonna, yeah. So this is yeah. kind of how it would work, right? Where you say, hello, uh, AI communities, right? And so you can see it here that this one, two, three, four, there's four words, but the way that the tokens were split up, right? It's it's five tokens, right? But you, so you can see it's like, 
Give it, it's not quite a word, but it's it's close close to it. Yes, it's thousand tokens, seven hundred words, something like this. I think I said it in the other way. And take a look there. Stand up. The last one was split in two. Even it's a single mm -hmm. word. And hey, tokenizer. Yeah. That tokenizer is the is a, is a nice place to <laughs> to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, tokens definitely check it out uh, on your own time. And again, as Bruno said, maybe we can have like a whole even a whole session on that uh, at one point. Um, the the temperature um that's basically like how creative do, do i want the model to be right and so if it's sort of zero right like i just want you to be more like fact-based like matter of fact uh responses you would you know turn this down to a lower value i believe it's zero i don't, I don't think you can set it to negative one I forget what the range is but the point is it's less than you know zero less than zero that's like very matter of fact and then one uh, is basically like closer to one is just more creative. In this case, we're like, we want it to be super creative and it's a responses, right? Um, these other things, they're more around like, you know, like, again, as I mentioned, these models work by like uh, generating the next token, right? So like kind of guess like what word would fit to complete this sentence, right? At least with text, that's how it works. And so these are just like a bunch of different settings that you can use to basically be like, okay, like, do I want you to reuse the same word? Do I want to add a penalty, right? That frequency penalty, meaning like, you know, do I do I want to have a, a little bit more variety in terms of the next word that's chosen, or am I choosing the same word every single time to complete the sentence? So again, like each one of these, we could do a whole show on, on how this all works. But for your case, it's just, you're just setting a bunch of, you know, values here. Maybe temperature is probably, and, and tokens are the ones that are most interesting here. And then, you know, off you go. So now that we're set up, we start our chat history. Uh, and so this is just a list, literally a, a collection of chat messages. And in this case, the one we're adding is a system prompt because that's sort of, again, right, what's defining that uh, interaction with, with, this, uh, with this application, right, and the model. So let me just make sure I run this, run that, and then start chatting. And so what's going to happen here is it's going to be, uh, I'm going to get a prompt. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get a, an input from the user, right? So this is going to be my inputs to this sort of chat. Um, and then what's going to happen is we're going to send this, my request, my, my, my input to the, um, to the model, right? And I think in this case, I'm using GPT-35 Turbo. Um, and we're just going to get a chat completion, right? It's going to be like, okay, here's my input. Give me back a response. Get back the response i'll put it to to the console and then just you know make sure to add these things to the chat history right and so if i were to kind of start this here i'll say okay so that's the system message right I'll say hi you can see that's my message and now the assistant this is the model responding um says hello i'm excited to meet you just right let me know where you're located and the hiking intensity okay so i say i am in the hudson Valley, and I would like a high intensity hike here. All right, let's see what it responds with. So, um, this is actually pretty good. Um, so it's like, okay, here's the you know the Hudson Valley. Here's great locations for hiking. Um, I've actually never done any of these. I've always wanted to do Breakneck Ridge. If you have done it, um, let me know how that is because it literally is. Just scaling up a wall, basically. Um, so I so I can confirm that this is definitely pretty accurate in terms of you know the high intensity uh, that it's recommending here. But you can see right, and in this case, I didn't tell it exactly. Here's how you need to you know, other than giving it guidance in terms of you know, here's information that you need to help generate the response, and then you know, just going and and using the information that the model has right to generate this response. There was really no really real input from me, right? And so you can see that you know pretty quickly you can sort of build this application that you know is generating responses uh, you know that are you know pretty pretty accurate or pretty uh, reliable right or at least to the naked eye they seem like they're fine. So yeah, that's that's how easy it is. You can get started right. In this case, all I did, all I'm doing is sending these requests to to you know the Azure OpenAI service, um, but it's really just a bunch of requests and responses right. They're like there's this is this is something that you know if you have worked with services before should feel very familiar to you. And just in case someone didn't, don't know about this, 
All of the demos that Luis is running right now, they are running inside the browser, in the VS Code web version they are, but also inside of a notebook. This is a polyglot notebook. This is an amazing tool that basically allows you to run everything here. You can see that we have some text, markdown, then the code and everything else. And hey, it's all there. So if you want to test this, if you want to try this, you don't need to install anything. You, all, you will need an Azure OpenAI a GPT model deploy, that's for sure. But everything else, you can run it here, which is super nice. Sorry, Sorry you're on habit. Mute. Habit. I mute myself. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and and yeah, the other thing to highlight here is like again, said at the beginning, code spaces are awesome. Um, I love that I don't have to set anything up, and obviously, you know, the provision of the resources, like Bruno said, right? Everything's just ready for you to to launch into this. Um, okay, so I'll kind of pause there um, to see if there's any questions up to this point. But I for the most part, no, question. So we have yeah. Alex asking about the demos. I share the repo. Mm -hmm. Eric asked about Window A, Windows AI Studio. Uh, I play around a little with Windows AI Studio a couple of months ago. Then I start to deploy locally my own models without AI Studio. Do you have any any advice there, Luis? Do you have any experience? Yeah, I, I have taken a look at AI Studio. Um, and I think it goes back to this, right? Like, um, let's see if I can bring this up. It goes back to this, right? It's like, it depends, right? Um, if if you want to, if you need to go through that step of fine tuning or training a custom model, right? Like, yeah, maybe that is a good solution for you. But it, it's, um, you know, definitely recommend starting off with the stuff that's off the shelf. And mind you, right, that off the shelf, because, you know, the, the um, what is it, Eric? Yeah. So Eric mentioned, like, you know, without spending loads of money in Azure, right, there's so many ways that you can cut this. So you can have off-the-shelf models that are out there, right? So you, there's this these model, uh, I don't forget what they call them, gardens, zoos, right? Like Onyx has one. And you can go and take one of those off the shelf. However, um, right, qu uh, quality of those models, the models tend to be smaller, right? So you're not going to get GPT-style qual uh, you know, quality. Right. Um, there, there's a few things that be, that are go beyond the cost and complexity. Right. That it's like, you know, how well how well does my model predict? How well does my model do? You know, X, Y, Z. And across of whatever axes that is that you're you're evaluating. Right. You're going to see that there are difference between I'm just calling an endpoint. And like, is it worth me going and like, you know, deploying this to production, managing all the things that would be involved with managing a model? Is that worth, um, you know, worth the cost of like or, or can I just, you know, make a request to some sort of service and have that, you know, automatically managed for them. So it, it's really going to depend on your scenario. Windows AI Studio is actually a really nice solution. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to come down to what is your scenario and, and, and what are the things that you're optimizing for? Um, let's see. Okay. So let me kind of jump into the next one here. Did I run this already? I did. Okay. All right, so this was just to like kind of highlight uh, another piece of this, right? Which is we're also here working with OpenAI um, and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of the same stuff here, right? So I'm not gonna sort of belabor the point here, setting up the chat completions, setting starting our chat history. Now, the thing that is a little bit different here is just uh, this, this you know, sort of prompt engineering component, right? And, and prompt engineering uh, is basically like, when you're interacting with these models, you effectively want to be able to like um, sort of give as much context to these models in order for them to generate, you know, responses or to behave in the way that you would expect them to, right? And, and setting those constraints around the model responses. Um, and so prompt engineering is kind of one of those things where it's like it allows you to like, uh, you know, more effectively design prompts that when they get sent to the LM, the LM, uh, you know, the models, have the capability of teasing out the different pieces and saying, okay, like this is what I need to do in order to generate an accurate response. And so in this first example, what we're seeing is just like um, a very generic prompt. Um, you're an AI system that helps people find information about businesses, right? So let's imagine that, you know, you're, this is in the search results. There's some sort of, you know, uh, chatbot or AI assistant, right? Um, that helps you find, um, uh, provide information about businesses, right? And so let's say though that my business is uh, some sort of like outdoor sports um, sort of business, right? 
And in this case, notice how in the prompt, I didn't really tell it anything about that. I'm just like, okay, uh, you're an AI assistant. You help people find information about business. I don't tell it I'm an outdoor sport, like an outdoor retailer. I don't tell it anything. I'm just saying you do. I, I could effectively just be telling it you do stuff and you respond to people. Right? I'm not being specific enough. And so, you know, you, it's great. And you might be like, okay, here's the system. And you can say, I want a pizza. And the model is going to go and respond to you like, okay, here's a bunch of nearby pizza places. So the model is doing what, what, you know, you asked it to, right? In the system prompt, it's helping you find information about businesses, but it's not helping you find information specific to my business, which is, uh, which is a uh, outdoor retailer, right? And so that's kind of where you start to, you know, uh, add more information and context to your prompts. And so you can see that now I'm saying, okay, well, you are an AI assistant, right? Um, but you're also, you know, I'm constraining it to like, it's an outdoors equipment business, right? Um, you also give it kind of an out, right? And you're like, hey, if you don't know where to direct the customer, here's a bunch of departments, right? And some of the things that those departments do that you can probably direct them to if they need additional assistance, right? And I also give it additional examples. Like, for example, if somebody asks for hiking boots, it gives them the number to, uh, uh, that doesn't look like a real number, but... <laughs> You can give it to one of your departments, right? And it's sort of giving, you know, you can you can sort of um, uh, guide how the responses come out, right? Same thing here, you know, my shipment arrived, so uh, damage, so, you know, here's the number that you can call. And also there's like these negative examples, right? So <clears throat> um, there, there's a few negative examples, meaning like, here's the stuff that I don't want you to do, right? And so again, if we were to start this chat again, you can see that, um, you know, there here's where it starts. Um, but here's all the context that's part of my prompt. Like this is all stuff that's being sent. And then if I tell it, hey, I'm interested in, uh, sorry. If I tell it, uh, I want to return some equipment, it's like, hey, sorry to hear it. Here's the contact information, right? So this is within scope of what I want the model to do. But then notice now that when I tell it, hey, I want a milkshake, right? It's not doing what the other version was doing. Now it's like, hey, we, we don't offer milkshakes. We're an outdoor equipment company. I can't help you there. Right. But if there's anything else related to my company, right, like feel free to ask that. Right. And so the, through the prompts, right, there's a lot of power that comes from like we're still using the off the shelf model, but we're sort of tailoring it a little bit more towards the scenario or the use case that we need it to serve. Right? Um, so, yeah, so that's that's the prompts and prompt engineering. Um, and then sort of taking it a step further. Right. Uh, I'm not going to kind of bore you with this this either. Um, but in this case, what we're uh, this is basically what we're um, what we're using here is this pattern known as retrieval augmented generation, and so this is yet another way that you can add to your prompt. So as opposed to here, where sort of my uh, examples and the context that I was providing is sort of static, right? There are ways that you can dynamically add context to this, and it involves sort of like these two different steps, which is um, actually if I go back here, let me kind of pull this up. And you actually have access to these slides as well, uh, by the way, in, in that repo. Um, but the way that it effectively works, just uh, make sure to uh, slideshow, slideshow. Okay. All right. So the way that this works is in order to dynamically inject that context into your prompt, right? So you could imagine, you know, you're asking questions about your catalog, or maybe there's some sort of database that you want, um, you know, this model to get information from to add that additional context to, again, constrain or ground the responses of the model, right? It's sort of like this, this multi-step process. One is you take the query from the user, like, you know, how do I return stuff or, you know, uh, uh, do you have any hiking boots in stock? Things like that. And it's going to go out and it's going to go retrieve that information, right? That is relevant to your query. And then once it retrieves that information, it adds it to the prompts. And then using that information plus your query, the model generates a response, right? And so that's kind of what's happening here um, with this. And again, I'm not going to kind of bore you here. The only thing that's a little bit different is we're now using embeddings. And so embeddings, are just a way to represent, you know, data, text, images, a lot of things that you can represent uh, with embeddings. Um, but what these allow you to do is you can actually do math on them because these are just uh, float arrays. You can just do math on them and you can find 
information like you know how similar things are so on and so forth right and that's how where that retrieval and the the the, the relevance comes into play here but other than that everything's pretty much the same right system prompt um in this case i wanted to uh have access to some wikipedia articles if we take a quick look at what our data looks like um right you can see that there's this metadata right so this is an article this is the title of the article this is text this is already like broken down into individual sort of um uh, what do you call it uh into individual sort of paragraphs right you can see this paragraph id that's tied to this particular article, right? And you can see that the embeddings, they're just a, a float of uh, float array. And in this case, the embedding is representing the text inside of, uh, you know, the actual text, right? So this in embedding format is represented as this. And so again, right, we can do math and find similar documents here. And so, uh have a bunch of utility functions the only thing that i'll call out is here right so this is one of those libraries that i was talking about these sensor primitives that we released in dotnet 8 um where you're able to give it here's uh, a bunch of documents and here's my user query right so compare my user query to the set of documents that i have available at my disposal i can compare the embeddings right and then find me the top you know the top k right and this and you know it's gonna be top five top three whatever it is right um and so we kind of go here, right? And we're like, okay, same thing, chat completions, initialize chat history, starter chat. And you're going to notice here that there's my system prompt. There's my chat history, right? So I'm also using the chat history to maintain context, right? Um, and then in terms of the sources, I, I actually wanted it to, to retrieve the top three, right? Top three documents. In this case, I'm asking you questions about Cristiano Ronaldo, right? And I'm like, hey, you know, how many uh, goals did he score? Uh, let me see. In 2014, um, I'm asking it information about personal records that he had. And then, you know, he scored 61 goals. Um, you know, who's the top scorer? And he, it tells me information about who the top scorer was before. And again, right, it's using the documents to ground it, uh, the responses on that information. But now notice how in my documents, um, I asked it about when was the U.S. Declaration of Independence signed. Now, I don't have any documents related to the U.S. Declaration of Independence. So as a result of it, you can see that based on the information provided, there is no mention of the specific date, right? So again, it's grounded. It's like, hey, I don't have that information, right? And so we are, we are, we're trying to constrain the responses based on that fact, right? And again, you know, this is pretty, pretty easy to do. And so in this case, it's a little bit low level, right? You kind of, I'm kind of showing you the mechanics, right? But you can see that there's a lot of patterns here that keep repeating themselves. You can see that, you know, whether it's generating the embeddings, you know, building this sort of rag pipeline where I go and I get the documents and I, I compare them and then I embed them into my prompt and do all these things, right? That's where sort of like these, these other frameworks like semantic kernel really come into hand. So a lot of this code that I just wrote here, right? Uh, could be significantly simplified if I'm using an orchestrator, right, or a framework like uh, like Semantic Kernel. Yes, and I am going to. I, am, I was going to also mention that that this is also changed the way that we, in example, when we search for information, information. This is because this, we are going to talk, and this is not the place to do a full session around vector search, in example. But you can think that we can do these natural language queries here, where you are literally asking, hey. What was the amazing thing that Cristiano Ronaldo did in 2014? And based on the info that the model have, forget about vector, forget about math, forget about everything. It will understand your question and it will try to give you an answer. And it works. It really, really works. And by the way, small set there. As an Argentinian, I will probably talk about Messi, not Ronaldo. <laughs> and we can talk about this later. But no, jokes aside. <laughs> That's also important. And the cool thing, and this is related to what Eric was asking here, is that when we do these searches and we do this math uh, processing, whatever, can we go to the source of information? And the answer is yes. And this is super important. As Luis showed, if we have this JSON file with all of the embeddings and we have the vector, which is the numbers, with all of the information we have in the header, the document, the paragraph, and more. So you can say, yes, in example, 2014, Cristiano Ronaldo broke the record of Champions League's goals. And this is mentioned in document one, paragraph three. I'm making this up, but you get the idea. So yes, this is also super important. 
using these techniques, we can get an answer, but also we can get the link to an answer, the source of an answer, which is super, super important. Luis, yeah. anything to add there? Sorry, I get passionate no. about this. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, I think that Eric, to a certain extent, right? And and this is not fully baked in, but I'm I'm gonna try to connect the thoughts, right? So you're gonna have to kind of work with me on that. Um, which is the next demo that I was gonna jump into. It's like, okay, well, right now we've been talking text, we've been talking, you know, uh, uh we've been using most of these models that tend to be text, you know, tend to be text specific, right? But there's other models that do other things, right? And and so, for example, if you were trying to extract information out of a document, say, for example, a PDF, right? That's where you have uh, these other AI services, right? That could work in conjunction with your, you know, for example, like an open AI type of service. So let me kind of, um, it's this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so you can see here that this is a PDF. And in this case, what we're going to be using is like an Azure document intelligence, right? And I think that there's a similar one for like video intelligence. There's a few, there's tons of them. Check out the website for Azure AI services because there's tons of them that you can see. And chances are that if there is a problem that you're trying to solve, there's probably a, a service for it, right? And again, the mechanisms work very much the same way as you're going to see right now, which is if I can call a service, right? I, I And just pass in my data, then, you know, it. Uh, there's not much that I think like I can focus more on my application rather than like, you know, which model am I using and, and you know, all these other decisions that you have to make, uh, you know, when if, if you were to sort of be doing this uh, yourself. Um, and so in this case, right, uh, it's it's basically like I have this this financial statement from Microsoft, right? You can see that there's tables and there's text and there's all these other things. You can imagine it having, you know, graphs and like all sorts of other components that are not just text. And so can we do something with that? And so, again, I'm not going to kind of run through this because I already uh, sort of did it, but it's the same thing. I have, you know, an endpoint. I have a key. I have my client for the document analysis service, right? And then I give it the, the URL to, um, to this PDF document, right? So, okay, great. And I just say, hey, go and analyze the document for me. And in this case, specifically, what I want to sort of extract are the tables, right? And so you can see here that there, uh, let's go back to the document. And there's this table here, uh, which has one, two, three columns and five rows. And then this one has, uh, I guess, two and two, right? And so that's kind of what you're seeing here, right? There's five rows and there's three columns. So that's that first table, right? If we take a look at the values, we can see the title of each class, expect this, right? There's, there's all the information that was in that table, right? And I've just now extracted this. And, and at this point, I can just do stuff with it, right? Um, you know, same thing happens here. If I wanted to display the contents of the tables, right? Like I can just do stuff with it. And so you could imagine, right? Where it's not just this one-off where you're just like, oh, well, I'm open AI will do everything for me, right? It, it, it certainly does a lot, right? But there are also some limitations, right? And so it's like, well, that's okay because there are these other things, right? These other, you know, uh, components or services or whatever it is, right? That I can use in conjunction. So you could imagine, right? extracting this information from the tables and then being like hey i'm gonna you know then shove this as context right into my prompt and be like hey um you know when are the notes due in 2021 right what's the the interest rate right for microsoft you know this this interest rate right in 2021 and now that you're using that as context as part of your prompt it's going to go and generate a response for you right and so like it's one of those things where like these services and or like these these different models kind of like just build on each other Right. Let's see. Okay, so I see that we're getting kind of low on time. Yes, um, we are, we yeah. are at the end of, of the time. So if you if people have some question, feel free to to share it in the comments. We we are going to read the comments, and I am also going to take advantage and promote our new our next session which is because we know what we talked at the beginning, that there are so many things, and we've seen today a couple of them, of what we can do. The whole idea is that we created, if you want to start also with AI, we created a repo with a set of very, very short, I will say short, they're not short, but they're amazing, very short pieces of code samples to do AI. So in a couple of weeks, we are going to have, I think it's going to be our own. I, I need to figure out who is going to join us to also talk about this. But the whole idea is going to be review uh, review those sessions and know more, more, more about this. Because we didn't go into, please kindly mention semantic kernel. That's probably one, two, five sessions around that. There are so many things. But the whole idea of today is, hey, help you if you want to start 
go back to the first link that I shared. I'm going to share it again one more time because this is a great a great way to know, okay, this is, this is how I can do AI with .NET. And hey, I love it. And as, as we mentioned, you don't need to install anything. Everything is going to be, if you are using VS Code on the web, you have everything there. Yeah, and there's uh, inside of the sort of repo that, you know, Aaron, Jordan, Matt, a few other folks on the team, right, use both of them are sort of uh, working on, right? Um, so as part of that, right, there's this other piece, which is, you know, we mentioned, hey, you might need some sort of, uh, you know, credentials and to stand up a service or whatever it may be, right? And then there's like these other really cool pieces of technology here, like the Azure Developer CLI, where you just like say, here's the resource that I want to deploy, go and, you know, stand this up for me. Um, and, and you know, uh, oh, well, I'm not going to show my dev container file because I have some keys there. But you can define it your dev container file, right? Say like, hey, here's the things that I want to to sort of, you know, include like the GIF CLI, developer CLI. Like, again, I think this is turning like into a code spaces dev container show because it's really awesome what you can do without, like with minimal setup here. Um, there's other things that we didn't really get to, but again, right, this repo is available to you, which is, okay, well, great. This is just, I'm just consuming the model, but what if I'm starting to get into that like fine tuning or I need to like yes. train my own custom stuff, right? And you're going to find that in sort of these trained AI services. In this case, I'm actually using uh, custom vision, um, right? And it's just also one of the AI services. And I'm basically just want to like classify cracked versus uncracked uh, sort of, you know, tasks, right? You imagine having some sort of like automated camera that is doing some inspections on infrastructure. And you're like, okay, is this thing cracked? Do I need to sort of, you know, inspect it some more, right? And so you can leverage, you know, these, these, these services, AI services to sort of train your own custom thing, uh, you know, cu custom model on your data, right? Um, and then the other one that I kind of sort of, you know, highlight here is, is ML.net, right? Uh, I'm only going to show this very briefly, but, you know, one of the easiest ways that you can get started with ML.net is uh, through through Model Builder, right? And we have a whole bunch of scenarios, again, depending on what problem it is that you're trying to solve. These are sort of the more classical scenarios. Uh, and these are more of the deep learning scenarios, right? So, again, that image classification, uh, text classification, uh, name and entity recognition, right? Again, going back to that discussion of like, you know, could I just do some of these things locally? It's like, yes, you can. But, you know, asterisk, right? There's going to be, the models are going to be smaller. The capabilities are going to be, there's like a lot of work and thought that goes into this, right? So it's not, it, it's not free, right? In terms of like free for all, right? There are some things involved, right? There, there be dragons <laughs> uh, type of thing. So, but again, right? The options are available. And, and yeah, so wherever it is that you, you know, sort of land on that spectrum, right? Um, we you know, really hope that, uh, you know, as, as time goes by, you provide us with feedback and, and we can sort of continue to make these experiences easy for you as, as .NET developers. Yes, and as we said, we are going to do more shows, so expect more sessions probably around Model Builder or probably around other topics soon. And I see that still people saying hi here. We have... Il Jasa, sorry for your name if I say it bad, from North Macedonia, which probably is an amazing place. I need to go to my geo lessons to see where is this. But yes, we are going to do more, more, more. And I don't know, Luis, do you want, I think that's good for today. We can wrap this up, get people excited about the next one. Remember, we are going to see this getting started with Net A and AI with quick start tutorials. Take a look at the links here. Any questions that you have, feel free to find me. I'm all over the, the internet. I'm happy to try to help people. Someone was mentioned that is planning to do some scenario using Zen AI models. Hey, I want to know more. If you can share what you're planning to do, we will be happy to try to help. And I also want to thank Luis because he said, do you want to start? He said, yes, here he is telling us, sharing knowledge with all of us. So Luis, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you all for joining. Catch you in the next one. Bye, everyone. Take care.